uh, <laughs> uh, Dr. Phelps is with us this morning to address uh, Black Paris. She's a professor at Emporia State University, and she is also the originator of this idea of this uh, that brings us together this morning. She wrote a uh, grant proposal that was funded, and because of that, we are afforded this grand opportunity. So welcome, and I present to you now, Dr. Connie Phelps. Well, welcome everyone. And um, again, my apology uh, for the delay this morning, but we're so glad to be together. Uh, it's wonderful weather here in Kansas, at least it's sunny, a little bit cold here. All right, so I'm going to uh, share my screen uh, and, um, and we're gonna start again here. Okay, so um, throughout the, the Institute, we've been talking about uh, online learning platform and using an online learning platform for students as they differentiate curriculum using the school-wide enrichment model by Joe and Suli and Sally Reese with type one, type two, and type three enrichment strategies. So we are now on the third week. So um, we're looking at this presentation as an example of what could be a type three. It is a type three for me because it has begun a, become a more in-depth study for me. However, when I was in Paris and took this tour, it was a full day tour. It was a type one for me because I had never um, studied Paris from that perspective before. And it was, I decided I wanted to do that. So I did, it was so interesting. It became type two. I started researching more about it as I um, you know, developed this particular presentation. And here we are. So once again, as Tony said, um, the uh, school-wide enrichment types are somewhat re um, relative to a person's experience with it. So if this is your, your first experience with uh, Black Paris, then it's probably a type one for you, okay? So also we're going to look at the aspect of equity or things that are have a, a, a sense of openness and uh, equalness, uh, not, not sameness, it's not exactly same, but it is uh, the ability to participate in, in an open and free way where there, there aren't lots of barriers, okay? So the, the paradoxical thing about this presentation um, and Black Paris in particular is that uh, the persons who uh, are featured a lot in the tour and in this PowerPoint actually were Americans, not all, but many. And the paradox is that in the United States during these times, when the black people were in Paris and openly received, they were not openly received in the United States. So that's just a little bit of a paradox. So here we go. Welcome to Paris. Um, I, I've been there, I think about seven times and in all together, I've probably spent about a year there. I, I have done, um, I've not really been a tourist, but I have, um, I have studied, um, been to most of the museums there. I've studied the language there. Um, I've worked uh, as a researcher at the University of Paris. So my time in, in Paris was, was usually pretty productive, but I always made sure I took time to do interesting things. So I'm going to share some of those with you, but as I do, I'm going to give you an orientation to the city. Um, has anybody been to Paris in this group? Uh, Giovanna or Christina uh, or maybe Rosanna, Sarah, Marua? Um, Anybody, you know, maybe raise your hand or something if you've already been there, because I welcome you to share some of your perspectives as well. But normally, when we think of Paris, we think of it as a very glamorous kind of a place. 
we think of artists and musicians and maybe scientists like Marie Curie um, and maybe um, academic institutions like the, the Sorbonne. Uh, so, um, you know, the Italians in this group might find it interesting to know that some of the first people outside of the ones uh, who were living there originally came from what, what is now known as Italy. So let's have a look at the organization of the city and the development, a little bit of it. And right here, if, if you look, the city has kind of a shape of a snail. And if you think about the shell of the snail, really uh, the very center of it is similar to the development of Paris. So in the early days, um, you know, before Christ, um, the people lived in this part of the city. The Seine River is represented by this blue line right here, and it comes from the Alps. The Seine River flows up to um, the north, uh, the north part of France. So you can see it curves quite a bit, makes quite a few loops, and goes right through the very center of Paris. Paris itself is only about 10 kilometers wide. So um, the, the city, the main part of the city has uh, what is known as two banks or two sides to it. So this side here, because the Seine River flows to the north is known as the right bank or the right hand side of the river. And everything on this side or to the south is known as the left bank. And you've probably heard of the left bank before um, because that's known as kind of a cafe culture um, historically. Uh, it's where the Sorbonne is and, and so on. So the very center of it though, it, it's numbered in arrondissement, okay? So uh, the first arrondissement is where one of the most famous museums in the world is located and that would be the Louvre, okay? So then, then curling around, if you can see the curse a little bit here, curving around like a snail, it goes um, in a clockwise direction um, from, uh, whoops, sorry about that, from first arrondissement to second to third to fourth, that's all in the right bank, cross the river over to the fifth, the sixth, the seventh. So those are the um, around these spots are right alongside the river. Once we cross the river again, then there's a second circle beginning with the eighth where the Arc de Triomphe is located, and then the ninth, 10th, 11th, 12th, and then the, the bottom half here of the left bank where we cross the river again is 13, 14, 15, and then finally ending up on the right bank once again for the third uh, you might call it a loop or part of the circle or spiral, 16th, 17th, 18th, 19th, and 20th. So there are 20 arrondissements. We're going to look at, oh, I don't know, five or six of them. There are specific. Uh, this was primarily a walking tour that I did, but we also rode the bus. So most of our uh, time was on the right bank, but um, we're going to look all around this, this first part of the spiral right there, OK? So um, this is in the 21st century. But back in the day, you know, the Louvre, you can see some of the original city foundations in the basement of the lower level of the Louvre. And you can um, see the influence of the Romans uh, from that very early time. So we're going to start our tour today with the first, or it's called um, the first arrondissement, but it's also got a little name to it as Le Premier. So Le Premier, of course, means the first. And originally, the Louvre was not an art museum. It was a palace. So uh, you may have heard of the Sun King, Louis XIV. Um, Louis XIV, who went to Versailles. Uh, but originally, this part of the Louvre was um, actually where the kings of France lived. 
But uh, there came a time where the kings did not feel so safe living in Paris. And so they moved, uh, Louis XIV moved west to the suburbs of Paris, uh, which isn't really that far away, to the, uh, Versailles and built an amazing um, uh, palace there. Okay, so here we go. We're going to go inside the Louvre, but um, we're going to look at some specific pieces of art in the Louvre that have to do with Black people in some way. So going back to antiquity, and the Louvre, of course, has, um, I don't know, didn't really talk about this, but if maybe we'll go back for just a quick second. You can see the pyramids. There's actually a small and a big one. And then over to one on the side uh, to the left is an entire another building. And to the right, there is an, an, another building. So really the Louvre is three buildings that are all connected. And it takes quite a while. <laughs> you don't do this in a day. You know? <laughs> Actually, if you can do it in a couple of days, that's pretty good. I'd say if you really want a good look at the Louvre, you, you probably need about a week because it is so large. It's three large buildings. And um, so we'll go back here. So these buildings are represented um, by various names like Sully is one of them. And most of the, um, most of the art in the Louvre is ancient, okay? So like the Impressionists and some of the more modern um, artists, they're not in the Louvre at all. So if you're going to the Louvre to see Monet or Renoir uh, or Picasso uh, or Matisse or people like that, you need to go to a different museum because they are not there. Does someone have a question or would someone like to make a comment at this point? Okay. Any question? Si? Torno e olive. Okay, is there a question maybe? Uh? Okay, all righty. So um, going back then, uh, we'll, we'll start with the oldest. Um, okay, um, and we have the wife of Amenhotep, Amenho, Amenho, I can't talk, Amenhotep III. So this is uh, Egyptian. So he, Amenhotep III was an Egyptian. Um, I think somebody might need to mute their mic. Um, from yes. Egypt, and yes. that goes all the way back to 1398 BC or before Christ. So this would be one of the, the more ancient representations. And you can see by the facial features that um, this is not a white person, okay? So when we, when we think of people from Northern Africa, very often they are darker skinned, of course. So um, this one, you, if you went to the Louvre and wanted to see it, you would go to uh, the building that's named Sully and go to room 24. So that's the way you find your way around. You have to kind of plan your time, which building you're gonna be in, which things you're gonna see when you're in that building. And most of all, what day it is, because the Louvre isn't open every day. I think it's closed on Mondays. And a lot of the time, various parts of these different buildings are closed for renovations. So you have to kind of look at all of that if there's something in particular that you really want to see. So you can see that this is a metal kind of um, portrait here, um, or it's a, it's a carved or um, from the um, 18, or excuse me, I'm up here, from before Christ, very old. Now, Madeleine Marie uh, Guilmine Benoit was a painter. And uh, she painted in the 1800s. And, um, you know, um, painting was still fairly traditional then because the Impressionists hadn't really started uh, that movement at that time. Uh, even though this would be the, the early 19th century, she was a little before that. But the thing that's really remarkable is that she was a woman and she was a painter. Uh, because her husband was fairly wealthy, she had that um, luxury of, of having time 
to paint, but, um, and she did paint for, for a while. So this is a portrait of herself and you can find that in Sully room 54. All right, the next one down, and we're going um, uh, from top to bottom here. This is a video and uh, I think it's, in, now we're much more modern. This was actually very modern because uh, this video was filmed in 2018 in the Louvre and it was Beyonce. Most of you probably know her as a very popular singer and her husband, Jay-Z. So they rented the Louvre to make a music video and I won't play it for you, but you can uh, go find it yourself if you want to see it. And not only did they sing, but they um, visited various parts of the Louvre and they um, uh, choreo, you can see there's some choreography, some dancing and things like that here. So I, you know, how many people um, rent the Louvre? <laughs> you know, how many people have that much money to do it or have that much influence? You can see winged Vict victory here behind them. That's one of the very famous, like Mona Lisa. Uh, it's one of the pieces of art that most people like to see when they go to the Louvre. So it's up, up at the top of a, a flight of stairs. You come up and it's on the landing. And then there are more stairs that go further up. So they're doing a, a dance routine there. So uh, there's a representation of uh, modern uh, uh, Black Paris, you know, because uh, like I said, not everybody gets to um, have that kind of privilege. The museums in France, like Versailles, is often does, uh, does do exhibitions of artwork. So if you ever tour Versailles, you, you, it would not be at all uncommon. In fact, the reverse would be true. You usually see maybe textile art exhibited as you're going through. So it's kind of a, a dual purpose of seeing Versailles as it is, as a tourist attraction in the former home of uh, Louis XIV, um, but also a place to, um, to uh, have modern art exhibitions, okay? This last one in the bottom corner, this is not a black person. Um, this is a white person, but quite elderly. Notice that the artist here is 100 years old. So uh, pretty remarkable, but his art was always black. So um, even though this is not a, a black person, it does celebrate the concept of it through his walnut stain and his Pierre Solange, um, who was dubbed, he was um, named uh, the master of noir, which means the master of black, okay? So that's the, the Louvre and just a little bit, bit of how Black Paris, that was part of our tour. Uh, well, not actually, I guess we didn't go into the Louvre. That's part of my type two, okay? And um, this would also be part of my experience, not so much the tour, because when I first went to Paris, I stayed in the Latin Quarter, okay? In, in French, it's known as the Quartier Latin. And of course, the Sorbonne is there. The streets are quite old. They're, they're pretty narrow because again, this is, um, this is where the Romans came. And I'll talk to you a little bit more about that. So this is the fifth arrondissement. We're in the Latin Quarter. And one of the most famous uh, buildings there is the Pantheon, all right? So the Pantheon is, a, um, it's, it's a cemetery. <laughs> it's an indoor cemetery. So sometimes we might call that a mausoleum, but the building itself is huge. Uh, it takes a day to go through the Pantheon. It's very large. Uh, you go through um, the main floor and then there's a, there's a, a floor that's underground where a lot of burial places are. So if you're buried in the Pantheon, that is one of the highest honors you can achieve in French society. Uh, the, the, the cemeteries in Paris are very well known. And um, uh, uh, usually um, very famous people are buried in these cemeteries that are on the east side, south side, north side of Paris. Um, 
and those those are all those all have tours of their own. Um, people from Abelard um, and Eloise early in uh, historical times, mod, you know, um, dated historical times, are buried there. Um, and uh, like Jim Morrison, for instance, is in Père Lachaise, uh, as is uh, Abelard and Eloise. Uh, and people still visit, they put flowers there and uh, they're very big things, but not nearly in comparison of prestige as the Pantheon. So to be, be buried in one of the three main cemeteries, outdoor cemeteries of Paris is a very high honor, but the highest honor goes to the Pantheon. So um, there's quite a variety of people, and I'll just uh, highlight three of them. One is a, a colonial governor from Africa, Felix uh, Eboué. Uh, because he was um, well decorated in the military and served in the, the uh, government uh, of an African colony, he had the high privilege and honor of being buried in the Pantheon. I'm going to go uh, over here uh, before Felix was buried there. There are people like Alexandre Dumas, and we will be looking at Alexandre Dumas again. Um, but you can see that Victor Hugo is also buried here. And um, I'm trying to see who, oh, Emile Zola. So Victor Hugo, the Hunchback of Notre Dame, and Emile Zola, a very political kind of writer, uh, they were white, but Alexander Dumas, um, who wrote The Count of Monte Cristo, The Three Musketeers, stories like that, uh, he was actually of, of Black descent. So uh, that's why uh, he's highlighted here. Now, I'm saving this one, and I'll leave it to you. I'm not so sure if I can play it on YouTube or not, but you can uh, check it on YouTube if you wish. Um, a year or so ago, there was a petition, or many people signed um, uh, their, their wishes to have Josephine Baker also buried in the Pantheon. Well, why would that be? Well, okay, why would it not be? Well, first of all, jo Josephine Baker is an American. She came from America to Paris, where she became a celebrity. She was a very young girl when she came from America to, to Paris. She sang, she danced. Uh, one of her famous dances put bananas around her uh, as a skirt, which would not be politically correct today at, at all. But the main thing was for her entertainment that the uh, people wanted her to be honored in this way. And, and by the way, she is buried there now. Um, is because during the French resistance during the Second World War, she helped France um, uh, with their espionage um, efforts against the Nazis. So um, she helped children. Um, she, she helped um, the resistance. And uh, so people really respected her, not only because she entertained people, but primarily for that reason. So that's the fifth arrondissement in the Pantheon. So we're on, we are on the West Bank. We're going to go just a little further away uh, to the West because we're going in that spiral direction. So just to the West of the fifth would be the sixth. So this is the sixth arrondissement, one of my favorite places on earth, okay? Uh, when I first went to uh, Paris, I stayed right here on the Boulevard Saint-Michel. Uh, there's a, a little place here for students to stay. And this is exactly where I stay. So every morning I could go into what's known as the Luxembourg Gardens, the Jardin du Luxembourg. And um, the, the fun thing about this is uh, once again, we have a very strong connection with Italy. And, um, and that's because Marie de Medici came to, um, live in Paris. And she thought Paris could be much more than it was. And she brought um, from Florence, uh, from the area of Florence, she brought, you can maybe see some of the architecture here uh, resembles that. 
but um, she did she did a lot of renovation for Paris, and this was known as her private water garden. So she could uh, enjoy this, and this would be one of the palaces. But now uh, it's not a palace, of course. It's where the Senate meets for uh, French and in Paris. So it's the French Senate here, but uh, most of this garden and this area was influenced by Marie de Medici. So um, I'm trying to see if there's much else here. This would be the, the gate into um, the gardens. It's known as the, the door or the Porte de Medici. The fountain is this one right here and the street bordering outside is the rue or the street of the Medici's. So once again, we have to say grazie to our Italian, <laughs> to our Italian um, uh, uh, civilization and the contributions that they had. Okay, next uh, we're going to, we're still on the left, uh, left bank or the Latin quarter. And we're sort of between both the fifth and the sixth arrondissement. So most of the cafe culture uh, before World War II and uh, during World War, War II, after World War II, even today, is in this area. So if you've heard of Jean-Paul Sartre, um, Ernest Hemingway, people like that, that's all happening pretty much in the 5th, 6th, maybe the 15th arrondissement. Now, with Black Paris, um, maybe not as well known, but very influential and why? Because of jazz. So jazz music um, is, is uh, what really uh, brought uh, the Latin Quarter alive at night. And it wasn't necessarily on the street level, it was below the street in what are, are called caves or cavo right here. So this would be the cavo du, du la Huchette. Um, this is Cafe Tournant up here. So this would be street level, a very nice cafe as it probably looks right now if you went there. Uh, this would be back earlier, um, uh, earlier in the 20th century, I think would be the right time for that. And here are some of the most influential persons uh, in Black Paris uh, associated with the Latin Quarter. So one of them is Duke Ellington a very famous jazz mu musician. And two others were writers, Richard Wright and Chester Hines. Uh, they were, um, Richard Wright was, I believe, um, I wanna say, okay, one of them was a detective writer and the other one was more political in, uh, in, in what he liked to write about. So once again, how does this affect equity? Well, it affects equity because uh, just like Josephine Baker, uh, the Black people at this time in history were not so uh, celebrated in the United States. But they had fought in the war, many of them, not Josephine Baker, obviously, but they had some of them had fought in the First World War, went back to the United States. They did not have the ticker tape parade. They did not have the recognition that the white Americans who served in the military had, but they were people, you know, sometimes we say something like we don't see color and, you know, you can maybe look at that in a good or bad way, but the fact is that it made no difference to the Parisians. It made no difference, the, the color of skin made no difference to, um, to most of the French people, certainly not in Paris. So what happened was they grabbed their clarinets and their saxophones and their trumpets, and they, uh, they came back to Paris and Paris loved them. Okay, so that is the Latin Quarter. And now we're going to cross the river to the um, Eighth Arrondissement to another area that's uh, equally famous, uh, or maybe more so one of the most famous streets in the world uh, the Champs-Élysées, and it is in um, the eighth arrondissement, which is called Élysée, um, and that is where the Arc of uh, Arc de Triomphe is located.
Okay, and this is actually where we started our tour. So all of this part is part of my tour. Uh, everything up until now is pretty much my type two, okay? <laughs> Does anybody have any questions or comments that they would like to make? Uh, Martina, do you wanna check and see if anybody would like to share anything or ask a question? Yes, at the moment, no comments and no questions. Se avete domande da fare alla professoressa o qualche commento, so che ehm, chi, chi era stato a Parigi? Um, Maura and Sara went to Paris. Okay, okay. So um, if they'd like to share anything, I'd love to hear it. Um, okay, so this is, um, um, we, we met for breakfast on the Champs-Élysées and had croissants and we heard a lot about the history of um, Black Paris. And then we um, went out onto the, the, this big boulevard, which ends in the Arc de Triomphe, and we started looking around. So um, one of the things we found, I'll, I'll highlight this first, is that many of the students that were in the commune um, in 1940 with the uprising were black, okay? And they were called the premier, okay? So, you can see it's called a man, uh, manifestant en masse. And uh, the French, it's kind of a joke, but um, <laughs> the French like to say that striking or going on strike where they're, um, they're fighting against something is their national sport, okay? When I arrived in the airport the, in, oh, I think it was 2003 for my first time, the postmen were on strike. They weren't delivering mail and they were blowing whistles and and um, tapping their drums and marching through Charles, uh, Charles de Gaulle Airport, <laughs> which if you've been on a plane all night is kind of bizarre. So uh, it's kind of a weird feeling. But uh, so, you know, this is not unusual. And in France, they're called many, you know, manifestations and families go out and they show solidarity, which is another way of saying equity. Okay, and, um, and they're very proud of that, very, very proud of showing uh, solidarity that way. So um, this would be one of the very first efforts of French resistance. And you can see that this is a black person there. Okay, moving up, uh, look at the grill work here, it's black. And um, this actually comes from Africa. And you'll see a lot, I mean, Paris is very famous for the balconies and so on, but on the Champs-Élysées, this is actually documented to have um, had craftsmen from Ghana, the country of Ghana in Africa uh, for black wrought iron work. And there's many, many examples of this throughout Paris. Okay, and you'll see a little bit more of that down here. Um, and then another uh, reference to Black Paris, whoops, uh, went down too low. And that is, I'm trying to move the pictures around a bit here. This is, um, if you saw um, the Da Vinci uh, movie with Tom Hanks, you know that there's um, little medallions in the sidewalks and those, again, we go back to Italy with some of that back to Rome um in in that particular uh story but um these are medallions that are embedded in the sidewalk and this one is at the place de la concorde okay that is where the guillotine stood during um uh, the french revolution and uh, so it's from the river thebes and what it says is at the rising of the thebes meaning the river the north emerges in paris so here's one of those medallions in the sidewalk, okay? And next, uh, going further north. So again, this is the tour. And now we are on that second level, on uh, the second spiral on the right bank, which would be the 13th, the 13th arrondissement, or the Butte, the Butte de Montmartre. So this is a, a hill. Paris is mostly flat. But up on the north side, this is Sacre-Cœur. 
And it was a church much like the church built in Venice that was um, commemorating, okay, you know, we, we've done some bad things here in Paris and, we, we, you know, God, we're sorry. <laughs> and we, we want to commemorate um, and, and, and sanctify and, and remember, um, uh, remember you through this church, okay? So this is a Catholic church. It's up on a hill. It's very white. You can see it from anywhere in the city. You, so you kind of always know where you are if you can see Sacre Coeur. All right, so we're now in the 8th arrondissement. And there is, again, a lot of art. But more to the point, we're starting, we're, we're very close to where most of the Black people lived. Okay, so we walked around and saw various artwork um, through the right bank. And at the end of the day, we all, uh, those who were um, still wanting to walk, we had to walk through parks, uh, seeing various artwork in parks and um, uh, the, the, the church de Madeleine. Uh, we went through all those places. And then we sat down in a traditional African uh, restaurant in what's called um, Black, actually Black Paris. So it's the, the Goudou. Uh, I don't know if you can see those words anywhere here, but it's like the drop of gold. You know, so it's this community on the right bank up on the second spiral area <clears throat> where the um, where the black people settled through um, early Paris and even now, because before we ate, we went through the black market, not the black market, like where you buy stuff you're not supposed to, but um, where the community of black persons live. And they have their own market there. I wasn't allowed to take any pictures. So that's why I don't have any pictures of that. It was to, um, you know, help them live a more normal life without tourists taking pictures of them all the time. So we respected that and I don't have any pictures. But it would just be where the people shop. They could buy fabric and um, they could buy household things and things, uh, stuff like that. So interesting area. And then all of these are very traditional African dishes that might be from Senegal, you know, because remember France had um, colonies in Africa like Senegal and the Congo and so on. So uh, this was, you can see it's pretty near the Sacre Coeur. This is the restaurant Les Delices du Sacre Coeur, um, which is the big church. Um, just a, not a real fancy place, you know, uh, very, very simple. Um, and this is our tour guide from the day. Uh, so he was with us all day. Here's the menu uh, with um, fish, chicken, you know, different things. One of the, so they had soup, um, uh, various grains and vegetables with African spices. The thing that I always really liked about Af Black Africa that I um, that I have enjoyed since then are the drinks. So these are like juice drinks. So um, this would be ginger and um, hibiscus, mango, and baobab. <laughs> so baobab is that tree from Africa. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's not bark, but it's powdered. So it's a powdered kind of uh, from the baobab tree, and they put it into a drink. So actually, these drinks are very refreshing, especially um, the um, hibiscus or the ginger. All of them are really wonderful. And sometimes when you come out of the metro, if you're traveling throughout Paris, and you're underground on the metro, and you're you know, going from one part of the city to another, you come up out of the, the metro uh, and there'll be a market or maybe there's street vendors there. And uh, so you can buy most of these drinks right there as you come out of the metro, not always, but in some places um, on the west side is where I found them. Or maybe you could get some food to go like this. So you know, that was the end of our day. It was a very long day, but really fascinating day. Um, and I like to close um, with this, okay? 
So I don't know, you can see here, um, I don't know how familiar you are with French literature, um, but this is Alexandre Dumas. So part of our walking tour took us through some statuary. There's lots of statuary in Paris, much like Rome. I've never been to Rome, but I know it's there. And so this is Alexandre Dumas, but there were actually three well-known Dumas. There was uh, Alexandre Dumas le Père, le fils. Uh, so there was like the grandfather, the father, and the son, okay? So the grandfather was a military general. The son was the famous writer of the Three Musketeers, okay? And uh, the Count of Monte Cristo, which is filmed in his bar, bar is um, actually took place south of uh, Marseille. So it's in the harbor of Mar Marseille in the south. I've actually been there. And so it's a whole other story. Um, and then um, the son of Alexandre Dumas was, was a screenwriter. So he was also a writer. So these are very famous people who had a lot of influence through French uh, history, but who knew that they, um, that they were even black? I mean, I grew up reading uh, all of these stories and knew of them, but I did not associate them with black people. And I think that is um, just goes to show that in France, they weren't thought so much that way. In America, we are very color conscious. You know, we, we use those words. I know you don't use them so much in Italy, but we use the word black and white, you know, um, and, and we we're very um, oriented towards races. And I, that's unfortunate, but that's how it is. And here, um, so um, who do you suppose this person is? Well, obviously it's not a writer, okay? <laughs> So if you look, this is a statue, and you can't see up on top, but it's a statue of Alexandre Dumas on top of this uh, pedestal here. Uh, and I have it, um, you can only see this part of it because I'm particularly interested in the guy that's behind uh, the pedestal. Anybody want to guess who that is? Well, if... You have read The Three Musketeers. This is D'Artagnan. And our tour guide liked to make the joke that he's got Alexander's back. So we have um, D'Artagnan, uh, who is, well, he's sort of the fourth musketeer. Um, <laughs> we have him guarding the author of the book. So just a little bit of fun with that. So that's... Um, uh, the, the tour Black Paris, was, which was my type one, uh, was Ricky Stevenson. She's an American, beautiful lady. Um, she was with us at breakfast time, and she's well accomplished as a journalist and, and just, just beautiful. Um, and then uh, a lot of the rest of this I filled in with my own in-depth study. So that's it. And... Um, I, I will turn it over to Joyce and Martina to see if they have any questions. So thank you. Thank you, Connie. Professoressa. Thank you. Yes. Martina, devo yes. chiedere alla professoressa se è, mai, se è mai stata a Torino a visitare il Museo Egizio. Che... Se no, può, può guardare su Rai Play, c'è una notte al museo di Alberto Angela in, che spiega tutto il museo egizio benissimo. È molto interessante e credo che le, po credo che le potrebbe interessare, insomma. Somebody ah, went to Versailles. <laughs> Ma Marua, Ma Marua? Marua? Maura. <laughs> Maura. Um, you went to Versailles? Yes, yes, yes. I, I like the, the garden very much. Yes. Yes, yes they're yes. beautiful. And the music, sometimes they have music uh, and fireworks yes. out there as well. Yes. But and a I little, think... but I was very young, very, very young when <laughs> I go. But you, you never uh, go in Turin, in Italy? 
Um, uh, well, thanks to Martina. Actually, I have been a few places in Italy. So I've been to Florence a few times, Venice, uh, Northern. But uh, in Turin, yes. there, but, but there is an um, Egyptian museum. Uh, is uh, very, very well. And uh, if you want, uh, you can look uh, in uh, internet, uh, a night in uh, Egyptian museum uh, is very interesting. Uh, and uh, you can uh, look uh, all the museum uh, is a special, uh, is a very interesting. Yeah, um, I'd say the, the bottom level of one entire building of the of Le Louvre is Egyptian. So that's, that's quite interesting. Um, and I didn't mention this, but um, another one of my favorite places in the Latin Quarter is the uh, Roman arena. So there's an ancient Roman arena. And I mean, today is Saturday. So um, probably about six hours ago, um, maybe longer, uh, people are playing soccer. They still play football. They're playing um, yeah. uh, soccer there uh, every Saturday morning. You know, so here's this <laughs> this arena that's like thousands of years old, you know, and they go and it's, you can see it. I mean, I have pictures of it. Uh, I really like that. And another thing in the Latin quarter that I very, it's another one of my favorite places is the Cluny Museum. And that started as a monastery. It was a ho hotel for monks. So when people were coming from, from Italy or from Rome, they stayed in what is a hotel. And in the basement, they had thermal, thermal baths. So mm -hmm. they had, um, um, they, they brought their own traditions from Italy and Rome. And you can still see the ruins in the basement. You can even see the ruins from the street, some of them. But it's really worth it to tour uh, that museum is one of my very favorite museums in Paris. So if I make it back to Italy someday, <laughs> if we start traveling again someday, I'd love to see the Egyptian museum. And I think you said Sarah. Uh, maybe Sarah was also in, in France or Paris. Was it someone else? Uh, or... Okay, Sarah, do you want to share anything? Noi siamo no? talmente okay. abituati a avere le cose dei romani attorno che non ci rendiamo forse conto di quanto siamo fortunati. Perché yeah. we feel lucky Noi... because we have uh, yeah. Roman things all around Italy. <laughs> yes, but... Yeah, <laughs> and, and for you us know... it's quite normal. Yes, I mean, uh, you take it you could take it for granted the the funny thing, I think it's kind of funny. Um, I When I told the, the French people, because I was there in 2019, that's a, right before coronavirus. Uh, and then I did, did go to Italy and stayed with Martina, who is very gracious. And uh, we have been working together ever since. Um, I said, yeah, I'm going to be going to Italy. Oh, you're going to Italy, you know? And, and every French person that, that I knew, you know, just loves Italy, you know, and, um, and a lot of times we think as France is, you know, it's kind of like the country to go to in Paris, you know, is this big celebrated place and all of that, but they love Italy <laughs> and everyone loves pizza, you know, so what can I say? <laughs> Okay, so thank you. You know, this concludes our, um, our live lectures for the Spring Institute. We are going to capture them all into um, a sort of a standalone institute that can, can be, uh, if people want to participate at another time, we won't have as the live lectures like this, but we'll still have like once a week uh, time to, to meet together. Uh, so we're working on that now, but um, I am you. The Italians have been such a faithful group. We've had three of these um, institutes: summer, fall, and spring. And you are the ones that are the stars because you keep showing up, and uh, you participate, and you want to learn. You know, so I commend you. I say 
brava, you know, for this. And uh, thank you so much. So if there are no questions, I'm going to close. This will be posted, of course, on the YouTube channel. And, uh, and ask Martina, you know, if you have any questions. And uh, I hope to see you again. So, okay. So I'll say ciao. Have a thank wonderful you, evening. Okay. Bye. Gracias.